Hi and welcome. This is going to be a quick video for an interaction to Adobe Camera Raw. And I'm Chris Parkin, a member of Rotary Camera Club and also a tutor for SIT, Southern Institute of Technology. So welcome to the course. We're going to be using an image for um, PSNZ, which is their calibration image. Um, really useful. You can download it from their website. Uh, and we'll go into actually some of the, the detail why I'm using this um, particular image once we get it up and up and running in Camera Raw. So we're running Creative Cloud. You notice I'm just drag and drop the image in. And then we can go to Filter and Camera Raw Filter, or you can use the shortcut. Control Shift and A, and that will open us up into Camera Raw. All right. So the reason that we're using this image to start with is we're just going to give you an overview of what Camera Raw can do. Um, what I suggest you do is check that your screen is actually calibrated correctly. So by that I mean you should be able to see the difference between zero and five percent. So zero is pure white, 5% is a very, very light grey. And the same with 95% and 100% black. 100% black, it's going to be black as anything. And then you should just be able to see that there's a shade change between that and the 95%. If you can't, I suggest you have a look at how you can change the brightness and contrast of your screen. You need to be able to see that all of those, otherwise what you're looking at on the screen isn't necessarily going to be the same as what everybody else is looking at. This is a cheap way of doing it compared to buying a spider um, or any of the other calibration devices, um, but I know as, as students and people starting off in photography um, it's not always practical to buy those and they don't, well they usually behave themselves but even so it's still worth just double checking with this that your screen is actually still kicking up the what you'd expect it to be. A um, couple of other notes, you actually want to be in an environment where you've not got strong light hitting this, your own screen or coming straight into your eyes, otherwise that's going to change what you you think that you're seeing and what your eyes are, are telling you. Um, the same goes for if you happen to be working on a laptop and don't have any choice, um, make sure that the tilt of the laptop screen stays the same when you're working because if you just tilt it up and down in front of you now you'll actually be able to see that the um, the image changes its its shade and its contrast just simply by by tilting that screen. So on the presumption that our lady is looking um, nice healthy skin colour and that you've got that um, 0 and 5 percent and 95 percent and 100 that you can see we're going to have get started and have a look at Adobe Camera Raw and some of the functionalities. Okay, simple first thing, we have a zoom tool so we can actually zoom in and out and you can either use this using the select tool or you can just simply click your mouse. If you hold down your alt key it turns it to negative and you can zoom back out. Very very useful, um, particularly when you're going to be doing some fine details later. Um, once you are zoomed in, navigate round hand tool or shortcut H and then you can hold your mouse and drag across and navigate around that way. Okay, so the next thing we're going to have a look at is a histogram. Um, the histogram is basically a graph of all the data that's in the image um, and particularly the, the color and shade of the pixels. Um, you notice this one's got a large number of, of single spikes um, and that's because the large parts of the image are computer generated and if we click on the shadow clipping mask we can actually see the areas that are pure black quite useful because if you've got areas that are pure black you actually don't have any detail in the black. Not quite so critical with blacks however very critical with our whites and the reason for the whites is that the human eye particularly um, is drawn to areas that are bright and areas that have high contrast and we want to make sure that there's detail in there for our eyes to look at. And You'll notice there are a couple of spots that are pure white otherwise you tend to end up with your, your image looking quite muddy but on the whole the majority of images you do not want your your whites to be blown out there are a couple of exceptions with that and um, in terms of black and white images but particularly when you're dealing with color ones you want to make sure that your highlights are bright but not blown okay we're going to have a look at the color temperature this time so the interesting thing about this image is it's already been color balanced so I'm not going to be able to show you all of the functionality but at least I can give you a, a basic overview. Obviously you've got a temperature control here which allows you to change the, the color temperature make it cooler or warmer, warmer 
And if you've done some fiddling and then decide that you really don't like what you've done and want to go back to the beginning, if you highlight the box and you can type in zero and that will take you back to where it is. You can also hit a, a reset function, but um, personally I, I would rather change one thing at a time, so, so resetting is fine. If your image is very, very green to start with, then obviously you can shift it towards the pink and um, vice versa if it's if it's a very pink image then you can shift it towards the green. There's also a very useful tool up here which is the white balance tool. If you want to use this properly you actually take a, a grey card which is um, printed in neutral grey in your first image <coughs> presuming that the lighting is going to stay the same the whole time. Take a photo and then you select the part of the image that is your grey card um, in this case I'll select up here because it's it's all grey and the computer will um, balance out those those colours for you. Now obviously if I click up here because it's already neutral it's not going to make any difference. If however I come down here and click on say the blues you can see how it pushes the, the colour balance back to the yellows. If I click on the greens it's going to push it back to the pinks and purples. Um, and if I click back up here it will get rid of it and bring us back to zero. So it's quite a quite a powerful little tool. It does not help you. Uh, it'll help you a little bit if you've got mixed lighting, but um, it doesn't solve all your problems. So you do need to be careful when you're setting up your your images that you try not to use mixed lighting, unless of course you deliberately want a, a color difference. All right, so we've done the white balance. We're going to go and have a look at exposure now. Now the exposure works very similar to your EV um, on your camera. If you increase it, it increases all of the exposure of the image. If you decrease it, it decreases all of the exposure. Um, if we actually turn our clipping masks back on, uh, you'll be able to see that very quickly we go from an image that is pure white. And as we keep sliding the exposure up, you can actually see the areas that are getting slowly more and more burnt out. Obviously, if I get rid of that, you can now see the, the get rid of the red you can now see how much detail we've lost um, and this is what happens when you ex overexpose an image except that that detail is lost permanently when you when you click the shutter um, the advantage of using camera raw is it still stores that image there and we can uh, the data there and we can go back and, and get it you'll note that one of the things uh, most photographers recommend is, is shooting in raw and part of the reason for that is that dynamic range, the area that the camera can actually save that is exposed correctly um, or where it still keeps information is a lot wider in a RAW file than it is in a JPEG and of course once you hit save you lose the ability to get that data back. You'll notice if we reduce the contrast the the person's face, the lady's face gets quite muddy um, and it loses some of that, that detail and, and just looks very, very flat. Obviously we can crank it up, um, pull it back to where it, where it normally sits and if you keep cranking it you can end up with other things happening. So we've got our reds are starting to, to lose some of the detail. We've lost lots of the detail in the black shiny areas over, over parts of her face, which isn't ideal either. So you, just because you can do something um, in Photoshop does not mean that you should and it's um, part of that is about um, developing that level of taste. You'll also notice when we increase the contrast that the whites are blown, that are blown out, there are more of them. The blacks that are blown, that have lost the detail, there are also more of them. Um, so it's something to keep an eye on. Alright, I'll get rid of that black there and we'll turn our clipping mask on for the highlights as this is the um, the next tool that's quite useful. If we bring our highlights back, you remember what I was saying before about losing information in an image. Sometimes, particularly if you're shooting in RAW, you can actually use this highlighter tool and recover some of that data. Now if you have something that is totally blown out and totally white, there's no more data that's going to be there. All that's going to happen is this white area starts to turn grey and again it can end up making your image look flat and muddy. Not quite the same way as contract, reducing the contrast does, but it, it can still do a similar effect. The reverse of course goes that if you have an image that has highlights but the highlights are not bright enough, you can increase your highlights until you're happy with the level of exposure, which is a, a very useful function. So when you're taking photos, if you make sure your histogram stays in the middle,
then when you get it back home and start editing on the computer, as long as you've got that data there in your image, then you can come and play with it. If you don't have the data saved in the camera, it's overexposed or underexposed and you lose stuff, then you're stuck. You can't do anything. Um, same thing goes with the blacks, and you'll note that if you look at the histogram while this moves, you can see the blacks are shifting the, the bottom end of the histogram rather than the top. Um, and the same thing with the shadows, but the shadows moves this part of the histogram a lot more. We'll get on to having a look at curves as well, and um, particularly if you use Lightroom, curves has a very similar setup now that will allow you to actually see what's happening on the on the exposure curve. Okay, clarity. Now this is probably one of the most useful and the most over-abused functions in Camera Raw, and basically it, it sharpens your image. Um, so you can see what it's it's done to this poor lady's face now. And what it's actually doing is it's not putting more detail in there. But if we zoom into our grey boxes, turn our clarity back to zero, if you take a colour sampler and sample the whole way across this grey, it is the same shade of grey, it's 50%. Our eyes see it slightly getting lighter towards this side, and that's because we've got a darker area here, and it's a, one of those little tricks of our our eyes, it's an optical illusion. Um, but the clarity function actually takes advantage of that optical illusion. We see that sharpness of that line. If you increase the clarity, this does increase the amount of brightness next to this line and darkens down the, the area next to this line. And so it makes the contrast around that edge harder. That's great because it gives you a, an illusion of detail. The problem is if you crank it up too far, you can start seeing this banding, these edges where it's um, going light to dark, light to dark, and it also brings out a lot of digital noise. So it's something that can be used, but please be aware you don't want to overuse it. One of the traps that you can fall into is, is overusing it and sharpening the whole image. Humans, as well as looking at for bright things and contrast, they also we're, we're naturally programmed to look for people's faces and people's eyes. So one of the, the nice tools that you can do is a selective adjustment brush, which is K, and then you can change the size of this brush. Now there's a shortcut key, which is the square bracket, and they will both reduce and increase the size, or you can scroll down here and change the size this way. So we'll shrink it down so it's about the size of her eyes. We'll change our exposure to, to zero, and we'll change our clarity up to about 50. And we're actually going to put some of that on our eyes. Now you see how, because her eyes are already nice and sharp and nice and contrast, contrasted, you've got a little bit too much of that, the white area around her face. So you can actually go back and erase this as well. So we can click erase, change our size of our brush. Oops, too small, um, and very, very carefully mask around the eyes so that the only piece that we're sharpening is the eyes. You can also change the amount of feathering, and the feathering is the how fast that gradient happens. I'll come back to this in a, in a little while, but um, yeah, just a just a very quick overview of that brush. It is very, very useful, very, very powerful, and a little, and in some instance is a lot better than just using the, the clarity slider here because then you're only affecting the piece of the image you want and you don't end up with, with some of the the hassles and issues of, of halos coming up which are a sign of bad work. Next function is our vibrancy which can change our colours. Now you notice that the colours don't get too overblown. Um, it's still keeping the detail in the reds. It's pretty much the opposite of the saturation. Saturation will increase the colours but it increases everything proportionally, and once it hits the top, it continues increasing them. So our reds and yellows start losing detail, and it starts making a real mess of skin tone. So often the vibrance is actually a, a more refined option to if you do want to pick up the colour. However, if you're wanting to reduce the colour and turn it into black and white, there are lots of ways of doing that. We'll go into one of them later, but the really quick option is to just decrease the saturation. You'll notice if you just decrease the vibrancy that it doesn't suck all of the colour out, it still leaves a little bit in. Decrease the saturation and it pulls all the colour. But as I said, not the best way of um, doing a black and white conversion, but we will come to that as we progress.